Let's talk about the word serverless. About a decade ago, Amazon introduced a way that they could use some of their excess EC2 power that was not in use by renting it out in very small time slices. They named this feature Lambda, and they invented a way of executing just one function. Lambda, of course, was Microsoft's term for it. We needed a more generic word. So somewhere around maybe 2015, the word serverless started to get attached to that particular way of thinking about running workloads on a cloud. The word serverless is kind of catchy. I like the word. So did a lot of people. And so it started to trend up. And as with any good term that's got sort of that magic oomph to it, the usage of it got a little creative. Sometimes we didn't know what we meant when we talked about serverless. There were serverless functions, serverless databases, serverless rack management tools, you know, a lot of things that really didn't sound like serverless was the right term necessarily for them. The word trended up, made its way into a lot of marketing literature. I use the term all way too often. I'm sorry about that. And at some point, as with any good buzzword, it started to crash, right? Because we didn't know what we were talking about when we used the word serverless. And we hit this sort of trough of disillusionment. Uh, I remember somewhere around, I don't know, 2021, 20, maybe early 2021, I stopped using the term altogether because it was sort of a little bit embarrassing because we didn't know what we meant, but it seemed like, uh, you know, you could kind of pick out the person who's going, well, yeah, I run my serverless functions and serverless database and a serverless, a serverless, and it felt like you would just attach the modifier to anything. But then an interesting thing happened because after it seemed to crash, it started to pick back up again. And in fact, now, it's trending pretty well. It keeps trending up and to the right. You know, it's got its little moments and things, but it's still trending up and to the right. What happened? Why is it that the term serverless has sort of made a comeback? That was the question we started with when we began working on this presentation because I think we both have our own interpretations of it, and it turns out we were really well aligned. So. I'm Matt Butcher, I'm the CEO of Fermion. Uh, you might know me around the cloud native ecosystem as the creator of Helm or the creator of the, co-creator of the Illustrated Children's Guide to Kubernetes. You know, the giraffes and, uh, and Captain Kubies that are wandering around were actually based on my kids stuffed animals. Uh, these days, I work primarily in the WebAssembly space at a company called Fermion where we are primarily interested in, you guessed it, serverless. So, uh, KubeCon Paris, I sat down next to somebody at breakfast and we got into a chat. And you have those rare moments where you meet somebody and within a couple of minutes you're like, our worldviews are remarkably aligned. So I'd like to introduce you to Jay Jenkins. Uh, hi everybody, my name is Jay Jenkins. So I'm the CTO for cloud computing at Akamai. And you know, I, I think KubeCon Paris was where you first met, but yeah, I think any five or 10 minute conversation I have with Matt, just a million possibilities jump into my head as sort of about where things are going and where things are heading. So I joined Akamai just after they acquired Linode to help with their cloud computing. Uh, before that I was with ByteDance and I was with Google Cloud for almost nine years. Um, and now I'll step off the stage and let Matt talk about, yeah, why is serverless trending again? I'm really excited about this. This is the first time we've gotten to talk together, so I'm really looking forward to giving this. Thank you all for coming at this time of day. I know I'm standing, but we're standing between you and dinner and beers and things, so we promise to do our best to make this an entertaining presentation. But what was the problem with serverless? Well, we kept using it in various ways, but we weren't really clear about what we meant. So let's kick it off by saying, if we were to give a fairly rigid definition of serverless that we're gonna follow through with through at least the duration of this talk, what would it be? And I think the best way to define serverless is to define it as sort of a programming practice. It's a coding pattern in which the developer doesn't write a long running server process, thus serverless, right? Instead, the developer constructs programs in a more event oriented way where they're thinking, okay, a request comes in, my code spins up and handles that request, does whatever it needs to do, perhaps returns a response, and then shuts down. So the life cycle of my program, unlike a server, the life cycle of a server program may be 
hours, days, months, perhaps even longer. The lifespan of a serverless application tends to be milliseconds, seconds, maybe minutes on the high end. So when we're thinking about it, we're thinking about it more as a programming approach, but one that also has an infrastructure component, right? The way you have to run these applications, or the way you would want to run these applications, is kind of that way where also you don't really want to think a lot about the infrastructure that you're deploying to. So ideally, the developer is fully invested in just expressing the business logic they care about and handling that one event and not really having to think about much else. Now there are a lot of sort of near relatives of this term that will just kind of practically speaking collapse into the conversation we're having today, right? So sometimes we talk about serverless, sometimes we talk about functions, sometimes we talk about functions and the runtime is functions as a service, which is a mouthful. Uh, a lot of times we do just use the term lambda to mean my definition of serverless, even though that's technically the Amazon uh, brand. And a lot of a lot of places are starting to use the term worker to mean the same thing. So you, you know, for all intents and purposes, you can sort of just mentally collapse all of those under the broad umbrella of serverless and say, we're talking about a development pattern. Now another way to sort of cut the serverless pie is to talk about where these kinds of functions are running. So sometimes you'll hear the term edge function versus cloud function. Uh, I think Google and Azure tend to prefer the kind of cloud function terminology when they talk about Google Cloud Functions or Azure Functions, but what they mean is these are things that are running in a data center somewhere, whereas ed fun edge functions tend to refer to that sort of nebulous term edge that we use a lot uh, and that Jay is going to, going to talk about quite a bit. Um, this particular distinction meant something at one point. But a sort of undercurrent of what we're gonna be talking about today is that that's probably the wrong way to slice the pie. And that's the big change that's sort of underlying what I think is the core of the resurgence of the serverless world. So kind of our central thesis is serverless was a great idea that kind of partially lived up to the hype the first time, but we hit some limitations. Now, Cloud computing itself, or computing the compute continuum itself, has evolved to the point where we can start to hit the next, the next set of features in serverless and really accomplish some things that we've never done before. Jay, I think, is gonna come up here and talk now about sort of our view of this compute continuum idea and how that is kind of the new underpinnings for this resurgence that we're seeing in serverless. Great, thanks, Matt. So. Uh... I'm gonna talk about servers, even though this is about serverless. Uh, because I think in order to talk about serverless, you do have to understand the underlying infrastructure and the changes that are happening there and the way that infrastructure is deployed. And I'm also gonna be a little bit critical of clouds, even though Akamai has a cloud, because I think if we're not critical of ourselves, then we're not gonna sort of grow and we're not gonna be able to change and support the types of applications that developers want to build. So clouds are very different. Um, if we take a look at centralized cloud architectures, which is what, for the most part, people have been building, it has delivered on certain things. Certainly in terms of elasticity, right? You can sort of scale things up and down horizontally. But if we look at how applications are deployed today, they tend to be deployed quite monolithically, even though we have these services. If you are running on more than one cloud, you tend to copy the entire architecture across those different clouds. Now that's for a number of reasons, which I will get into later. But I think if we want to understand what the possibilities are, we should take a look at what happened with content early on. I mean, it was a very different web when CDNs were invented, but I think what's true is that the past decades centralized computing models are going to need to evolve to meet the next decade's challenges. As we look at things like AI, IoT, automated devices, virtual reality, Centralized cloud is not the solution. We need to be able to think about where things are running and why they need to run there. So if we take a look at where CDN and Edge is today, so CDN, Akamai invented that, what, 25 years ago, and it, while it's changed a little bit, the general principle is the same. But 
if you take a look at the type of web that CDNs were invented for, it's a read-only kind of web, right? It was very, it's a very web 1.0 kind of solution where I need to consume content. But that's not the world that we live in today. We're writing applications that need to be responsive, that are transactional, that need request and response, and the expectations of users and the expectations of devices and autonomous vehicles need that at lower latencies than ever before. So if we could reinvent cloud based on what we know today, if we actually thought about cloud, how would we build it? Would we centralize it? No. There are certainly benefits to centralizing it, but ideally we'd want it closer to where the users are. We'd want it closer to those devices where we can. Now, there are other constraints we want to think about. Maybe it's not about latency. Maybe it's about cost. So we want to run it at the place that's going to cost the less. Maybe it's about sustainability. So I want to, want to run it in the place that is going to have the least amount of carbon emissions. Maybe it's about a regulatory constraint. So I need to keep data within a particular region. All of these require these new types of distributed architectures. And so that's what we're looking at today. It's a world where you have a capability to not just run content, or not just put content anywhere, but to put compute anywhere. You want the compute available where you need it. And this has a number of benefits, and, um, and it also has a number of challenges. So the benefits are obvious, low latency. So from one of our edge locations, so, you know, I think the Apple Vision Pro, 12 milliseconds, right, from the external cameras to your eyes. If you have an edge location, you can get single-digit millisecond latency from these edge locations to a user. So what sort of capabilities does that give you? Well, if it's 12 milliseconds from the external cameras to my eyes, that means I could actually make that headset lighter by offloading a lot of the processing that's happening onto an edge access point. I have other capabilities to take certain services and move them closer to the users. Think about uh, common frameworks like backend for frontend for just simple websites. I can now aggregate those APIs at the edge. I can do caching at the edge. So if I have a Redis cache, if I have that at the edge, not only am I now accelerating my database, I'm now accelerating the entire application. And this brings us back to the world of serverless. The great thing about the concept of serverless is not only the fact that, is that you can spin these up and also spin these back down again, but ideally, you can choose to run these where they need to be run. Maybe it is centralized. Maybe that's where your data is, or maybe that is where you know, that, that uh, specialized processor is, that GPU is. Maybe it is about latency. Maybe it is a regulatory constraint, so it needs to run in a certain location. Maybe it's both. Maybe you can actually move through that continu uh, continuum of compute, move towards the data center in order to save costs during low times, move more towards the user during those peak times to offload those servers. So you know, this is a map of the locations where Akamai currently has points of presence. And for us, we are looking at how to actually distribute the compute to 4,100 locations. Right now, we're very constrained about how we think about how to deploy applications, that they need to be deployed in one place in order to conform to a certain uh, cost model, um, because egress is expensive. But what I want you to sort of understand is those previous cloud constraints no longer exist. Don't think about your applications being in one place. Think about what would happen if you could, in fact, not just write once, run anywhere, but run them everywhere. What if you could ephemerally spin something up when a user needs it and shut it down when they don't? Because these new types of topologies are available already. You can do this today. And you can do this across multiple clouds. You don't need to pick one single cloud. But there are some big challenges. 
Number one is hyperscaler cost models. Egress is horrendously expensive. If you wanted to run an application that worked across multiple clouds in order to give you the best price performance for processing, you're gonna spend a lot of money on egress. Egress costs are way too high. Everybody knows it, everybody complains about it, but there's very little that's been done about it so far. So that's something that absolutely has to be fixed. And the other things are just around the capabilities to wrap your arms and manage that sort of infrastructure. Running multiple clusters of Kubernetes is still hard. Doing so in a distributed fashion where you have different services for the same application running across different clouds or different locations is extremely difficult. But they are being solved, right? If you take a look at some of the projects even discussed during this conference, the ability to observe these platforms, the ability to monitor, the ability to mutate those platforms, those things are already starting to happen today. And you can see a world where Kubernetes event-driven auto-scaling becomes Kubernetes event-driven automation, or Kubernetes event-driven architectures, where the events actually define the architecture so that it can actually mutate in order to meet your customers' needs, or to meet your cost needs, sustainability needs, regulatory needs. So that is how things are changing, um, and it's going to be an exciting world where a lot of this becomes more automated, more ephemeral, and can be a true cloud that is moving across the globe as your customers need it. And now to talk about how SPIN is starting to address some of these problems, I'll hand it back over to Matt. And don't go too far, I'll need you as a human microphone stand in a moment. That's right, yeah, I, ha I have I'm, a job. I'm good for a couple slides, then I'll... Uh, uh, I love this because I grew up very much thinking of the world in terms of the client server model. And so you got compute power out there, and first it was in a data center that was mine, then it was in a data center that was someone else's, but the client was on the other end of the spectrum. And that kind of, the way you lay out the vision, it's a continuum of computing, right? That goes all the way from the, the watches we wear on our wrists these days up to these massive data centers under the ocean. I mean, it's a, we, if, if we can do that, right, if we can fill in that full spectrum of computing, we need to start thinking about different ways to build our applications. I'm not going to say that we've got jumped to the end game yet, but I think we just hit a, a big incremental step here, a big step in being able to do something that has not been able, that we have not been able to do before. Uh, we call it uh, selective deployments, but the basic idea behind this is that as a developer, I can build a single application that's composed of different components. I can test it locally, I can run it through one single CI CD pipeline, uh, I can compile it with one command even if it's written in a whole bunch of different languages. But then when I deploy it and send it over to my platform engineering team, they can take this same application and say, well, I'm gonna break this up and run it in a way that matches the kind of topology we need in order to best serve our users. So it sounds a little bit fictional, so let's walk through it a little bit and see sort of what the pieces are of this, right? So the first one is Spin. Spin is a developer toolkit that allows you to build serverless applications. Uh, sort of the secret sauce in here is a technology called WebAssembly that you can compile an application to a bytecode format that can run on all these different operating systems and all these different architectures. What that means is the developer doesn't have to know really anything at all about the target environment into which they're deploying. They don't need to know how big the VM is. They don't need to know if it's an ARM processor, an Intel processor. They just build the code and focus on the business logic. Spin also provides a number of tools to help you get going faster. It has a built in, it has a build system that allows you to build, say, uh, multiple functions, as a, you know, multiple serverless functions, but compile them with just one command, even if they're in different languages. So you can type spin build once, and even if you've got some components in Python, some in TypeScript, some in Rust, and some in Go, that one build command will build all of those into a deployable artifact. Now there's a second piece of this that I'll talk about here and there, called spin cube. So you got your developer tool spin. If you're gonna deploy it into Kubernetes, spin cube is the tool you wanna use to run in your Kubernetes cluster. Both spin and spin cube have been contributed to CNCF, so these are both fully open source projects. Spin cube uh, sort of plums in WebAssembly support and thus serverless function support directly into Kubernetes so that you can deploy these things as if you were deploying 
containers, but they will run under the profile of WebAssembly. So you've got all the primitives that you're used to with Kubernetes, all the instrumentation, policy controls, uh, routing and networking, all of that just comes for free. You're just kind of adding the WebAssembly runtime with SpinQ. But Spin3, which was introduced on Monday, does something new, this selective deployments thing. So let's talk for one moment about that. I'll give you a couple of block diagrams and then we're gonna look at some code and we'll see how that goes. Uh, <laughs> it's the very end of the day. I'm sure the, uh, the demo gods are not gonna smile upon this, but we'll try it. Um, so the big thing in spin three is that I should be able to code under you know, one VS code project or one Vim project or whatever and build fairly sophisticated multi-serverless function applications run them all in kind of a unified way, edit them all in a unified way, compile them all in a unified way, send them through one CI CD pipeline, and then let the platform engineers figure out what to do with it from there. So the platform engineer may say, at deployment time, I wanna use this particular, or you know, I wanna break this, these 12 uh, serverless functions into three logical groupings or two logical groupings or whatnot. So it kind of looks like this. Here's a very simple one. A uh, mythical application that has four serverless functions, each of these acting basically like its own microservice. The developer's view is that stack of four, right? All together, editing them all together, compiling them all together. They package it up as an OCI image, push it up to a container registry, even though it's not a container, it's, a, it's, a Docker, it's an OCI image, a Docker image, but if you were to look inside of it, instead of seeing the layer diagram of file system pieces, you would see a bunch of web assemblies. And then when you run those locally, they all come up and run in one process, listening on one port, doing, the, doing a single job. You pass that artifact over to the platform engineering team who supplies some configuration. They're not recompiling, they're not decomposing the archive or anything like that, they're just providing their Kubernetes YAML or their spin toml or whatever the, the configuration file is that's their sort of artifact of choice. We'll see some, some spin cube files which are just traditional Kubernetes manifest files. But you apply this configuration and say, I want my application to express itself this way. In one case, this is the front end piece. I want that same application to express just the back end functionality over here. And instantly your one single application becomes two different microservices. And you can scale them up and down independently. You can apply different policies independently. Uh, you can add different memory allocations and, and limits to them independently. So effectively, the platform engineering team gets to do their, their job, right? They get to make decisions about the platform without having to go back to the developers and say, hey, can you reorganize things this way and that way? So we look at it as sort of solving a social problem in addition to an engineering problem in that a lot of times the friction between development teams and platform engineering teams arise because developers make one set of assumptions and decisions and then the platform engineering team has to kind of work with those. And then when something goes wrong in production, the platform engineering team often has to go back to the developer team and ask for changes. This kind of environment solves that kind of social problem in addition to allowing us to start to deploy in these kind of new and exciting ways. But there's no reason you would have to deploy this application in its different expressions into just one environment. You could choose instead to deploy an application where part of it was running in your data center's main Kubernetes cluster and another part of that same application was deployed to the edge. You could do it in more sophisticated environments where maybe the admin interface runs locally on your on-prem hardware while the database aware code, things that need to be close to reliable data sources run in the data center and the front end code that's highly latency sensitive gets pushed out to the edge. And because this is all a matter of how you're doing your deployments, you could even make decisions at deployment time with deployment tools that said things like, hey, if there's, we got an LLM that we wanna be able to make use of. If there's a GPU available at the edge, run this piece of it over here at the edge. If not, run this piece in the data center. So we can even start to make some decisions at deployment time that normally would require shipping the whole thing back to the engineering team and saying, hey, uh, got a big favor to ask. Can you go back to that edge function and make it be able to do the inferencing there or something like that, right? This sounds a little bit fictional, so let's get into a demo and let's see what this actually looks like in practice. Uh, if you're, if you're holding the mic. Yep. All right. So I'm gonna try and switch us over. Do you see a VS Code editor there? All right, okay. 
So this is a spin.toml file. So effectively, when you build a spin application, every spin application is composed of one or more functions. And these functions are just as we described them at the beginning, right? Event comes in, function spins up, does its little job, returns a response, and shuts back down. When I start building these list of functions, what I'm saying is in my one project, I'm gonna create, in this case, something like 10, 11 different functions. And so I've declared a whole bunch of functions here. You can see everyone is labeled component. Component is sort of the WebAssembly terminology for this little unit of encapsulation. Uh, so if I have 11 components here, that means in that Docker image, I'm actually gonna have 11 .wasm files, but when I run them, they're all gonna be running in one unified, well, if you run them locally, they're running in one unified runtime. As I start splitting them up, the way we've been talking about, we'll run some over here, some over here, some over there, right? All right. So, and we can take a look at this project. This, this is a project that I had a great time writing. It's a, like a content delivery system, a content management system. So it's got a CMS core, it's got a template engine, it's got a little QR code generator, uh, you know, some token authentication stuff. Uh, the QR code generator is written in Rust, the template engine's written in TypeScript. I think pieces of this are written in Go, and actually in a couple cases I just pulled off the shelf components from other projects and just included them in here and I don't even have the source code available, uh, which is cool. It was basically Basically, we're hitting the reusability uh, metric there. So I've got this, I've got 11 functions here. I'm gonna build them with one command here. Let me see if I can give you a little bit more. There, is that? So I'm gonna type spin build, and it's gonna compile all 12 of the, all 11 of those functions into their, their binary format. So for interpreted languages, this is actually encapsulating the interpreter and then uh, initializing the interpreter with all the files in it. With a statically compiled application, we're just building one binary. Uh, so essentially, we can run just about any kind of language in this sort of environment. So it takes a little while to compile. Um, because I'm compiling 12 different things in a variety of different languages. But once it's done, I'm gonna type the command spin up. That's gonna start a local instance of this for me. And it's gonna take a couple of seconds. And then it's gonna start up something on localhost. I think port 3000 is the default. And there we go. So we got something running on localhost. We can take a quick look at this. So this is the, uh, the CMS system. Here's the little QR code generator that I talked about. We can log in here, check out the back end. I created a whole bunch of content. Uh, the salient detail here is that localhost is the host name in all of these, right? It's deployed on one, uh, in one process run, listening on one port. So I'm just kind of clicking around in this app. That's my local developer experience. So then I would take this and package it up, uh, typing a spin, registry push, build it all into one Docker image, push it out to a Docker registry, and then I would deploy this into Kubernetes. So here's the Kubernetes manifest. I'm gonna collapse that there. Um, not so much an issue that you'd be able to read through all of this, but just see the shape of this, right? It should look very familiar. It looks basically like a deployment with a couple of different options here. Uh, when you execute this, it will actually get rendered all the way down into pods. So the unit of deployment, the low-level unit of deployment remains a pod, but instead of invoking the container runtime, it'll invoke the WebAssembly runtime. Why do I point out this detail? Because essentially what I wanna point out is that this is Kubernetes all the way down. This is not some application layer that's an orchestrator on top of Kubernetes or something like that. It is built into Kubernetes. When you install SpinCube, you get the true Kubernetes experience top to bottom. So let's see, we got a spin app here. Spin app is sort of the top level ex expression of a spin application. Uh, if I scroll through this file, I'll see I've got one there. I've got a second one there. If I keep scrolling all the way down, I got a third one. Why do I have three? I've got 11 components. I've got one application. Why do I have three spin apps? Well, because as the wearing my platform engineering hat, I went, okay, I can break up my 11 component CMS system into three logical groupings a front end, a back end, and an administrative interface. I want the collection of functions that form the front end, front end, token auth, repository, proxy, files, QR, this stuff right here on this line, I want that to run as one logical unit. Then I wanna take my back end and I wanna run that as a second logical unit. It should have the content repository, the navigation generating system, the log notification system, the installer, stuff like that. And it's gonna essentially function as a headless CMS. 
So I got a front end and I've got a back end. And then of course I've got that admin interface where I was showing some, you know, the, the list of content and things like that. We'll take a look at that again in just a second too. But I've now taken an application that the developer built as one whole. And I, as the platform administrator, said, I'm going to break this into three logical groupings, front end, back end, and admin. And now I can deploy each of these things to whatever place makes the most sense to deploy them. So we've got three Kubernetes manifests. I'm not going to go through the Kubernetes deployment process because that'll take a little bit of time, but I'm going to show you what it looks like once I've deployed it. So essentially, kubectl apply that particular file, wait a couple seconds, you, you start to have uh, these, these pods start to come online, and you can see I've got my hello SLC demo thing here that has nothing to do with this presentation. But then we've got the three that we just talked about. There's the Luxor admin, the Luxor backend, Luxor front end. And again, using K, uh, K9s, uh, if you've seen this before, I'm looking at the list of pods. So we're actually looking at the pods here. Uh, and again, the illustration here is deploy the spin app. It expresses itself using all the Kubernetes native uh, concepts. So I can go look at that and see it just the way I would see a containerized application, even though in this case I'm running WebAssembly. So now we've got a case where wrong direction, where I've deployed three apps. Uh, I went, went ahead and attached three different load balancers to it, uh, set all these things up the way I want. So I'm running inside of Linode, uh, the Linode LKE Kubernetes distribution. I attached node balancers to all of these, used the uh, Akamai DNS and set all of this stuff up ahead of time. Didn't want to do that in real time because I'm not that good at it, so it takes me longer than it takes everybody else. But check this out. That is the lovely headless CMS. It doesn't do anything uh, <laughs> on the home page because it's a headless CMS. Behind the scenes, if I did send my REST calls and sent my tokens, I'd get some JSON data back. Uh, but it's just functioning as the back end. Normally, I wouldn't expose this on an open port because there's no real reason to. Uh, but for the illustration purposes, thought it'd be fun. So I've got my CMS installed there. Uh, here's my admin interface. So if you can see all the way up in the, in the top bar, I don't know how to make that part bigger, but it says editor.technosophos.me. Uh, that's the, the editor interface. Uh, so this one's running on be.technosophos.me. Now I'm on editor. So you can see I'm actually running these as separate applications, listening on separate domains. Most of the time, we think this one actually has a password on it. So if you try and get in there, you're not going to be able to edit my content, I hope. Uh, but you can see, here's my content. Hello, Salt Lake City. Let's update that. Let's see if I can spell friends. Hello, Salt Lake City friends. Let's go save it. And there we've edited some content inside of this second unit. So we saw the back end. We edited something in the front end. It contacted the back end, updated the repository. Now I should be able to go to the front end. Here's frontend.technosovos.me. Hello, Salt Lake City friends. And you can kind of get the idea. We took one application that when we looked at it under localhost, it was running in one process. And there was no network traffic going back and forth between components there. It was just running in one process. Now we've spread it out into three, and they're communicating with each other using networking that essentially Spin just enabled us to be able to run in this, in this kind of format. So we've taken a single application, broken it into three, running it all in the same Kubernetes cluster. We can go one more, though. Let's take the front end, and let's push it out to the edge. Uh, and now I realize I don't have my my uh, Akamai dashboard. So I created an edge node using Akamai's Gecko nodes, these, these Gecko compute instances, uh, very, very fast. Uh, and they function, essentially, I can install a spin app onto this um, very easily. Doesn't really matter what I'm running there. I can run K3S and install SpinCube on there. I can install just the spin runtime and deploy the application that way. They're very flexible. In this case, I'm running just the spin engine so that I can show you we're actually communicating without Kubernetes in the middle here. So here we go. Here's our edge one. Uh, the, the only way you can tell, uh, if you can't read that URL bar, is it says edge on the top. I changed the title so we'd be able to tell. All the rest of this application is running in Dallas. This one node is running in Denver. Uh, I happen to live in Denver, so I picked one that was close to me at the time. Uh, <laughs> I probably should have chosen Salt Lake City. But you know, uh, so this one here is running in Denver. It too is just contacting back upstream to the main repository. So I've taken one app that while I was developing Single, single, single unified application. 
and then split it up into three different sort of logical groupings and then chosen how I'm going to deploy those logical groupings into Kubernetes, into edge nodes. Again, going back to what Jay was talking about, instead of looking at things as client and server, we're now starting to look at a continuum of computing and enable platform engineers to say, it makes the most sense to deploy this piece of the app here, these pieces of the app there, and maybe another piece somewhere else. If you come by the booths, Akamai, Microsoft, Ampere, and Fermion, we're, we're each running a segment of an application at our booths that has a, a decibel detector there. So you can go and scream at people's booths, uh, collects all the data, you can take a look at the dashboard. But effectively what we did there is that application is running on-prem on an Ampere box, in AKS and Azure, and on Akamai's no, uh, Gecko. And so we took the same application and actually spread it into a hybrid cloud environment and are running it on the show floor at KubeCon. So take a look at that if that's the kind of thing that interests you. Uh, but that's, that's how this demo works. And I can probably grab this microphone and head, head back to the, uh, to the last slide here. What's really exciting about this to us is that we've gone from that sort of notion of having to develop an application for a particular target environment. This is a back-end application. If I want to write a piece that goes on the edge, I have to use a bespoke special kind of JavaScript and I can only run it on one provider. If I want to you know, mix and match, essentially I as the platform engineer have to go back to the dev team and say, can you please re-architect the application this way? That was a relic of the way that we used to think about cloud. If we're gonna think about cloud in this kind of continuum model that Jay talked through, we have to come up with application models that can run on top of that. And the exciting thing to us is that this serverless paradigm, this way of just event handling based delivery, means that it's simple to deploy these applications into these fairly complex environments and even make decisions on the fly about how to reorganize this and reorient things such that you're not constantly introducing strife between the platform engineers and the developers by saying, hey, we're shifting from ARM to Intel. We need this thing to be rewritten and this JavaScript to run over here on the edge. Instead, it is the platform engineer's responsibility, which I think would be a joy to most platform engineers, to actually have the freedom to engineer the platform the way we want to. And that's what we get with spin deployments. Uh, that's what we get with this continuum of computing and this kind of new way of looking at the cloud. And I'm racing through the slides because I accidentally restarted the slideshow. There we go, the concluding slide. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about selective deployments, about this, this cloud continuum, about uh, you know, being able to run some of these things on uh, Gecko nodes or on LKE, uh, stop by our booths. I think we'll both each be at our respective booths tomorrow. I'll be at the Helm booth for a little while tomorrow. Uh, we also both recently, Akamai and, and Fermion both had some different announcements. You can check out our blogs and see them there. Uh, and definitely walk up to a booth, find the sound sensor and scream as loud as you can and then see if you can, you know, out scream the other booths. <laughs> With that, look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Uh, thank you again for uh, eating into your dinner time. That was not an intended pun. Have a great KubeCon.